in my 42 years of being in the real estate business, I don't think there's ever been a product need in our country in my lifetime that is as great as the need for affordable housing. Daryl, welcome to the show. Brandon, thank you very much for having me. For those of our listeners that don't know you, could you briefly introduce yourself and your organization, please? Delighted to. Um, Daryl Carter, uh, my company is Avanith Capital Management. Uh, we own and operate affordable apartment communities across the, the country. We own about 100 communities, about 16,000 units in 15 states. Uh, we're roughly the biggest part of our per- portfolio are uh, Seattle to, to San Diego and New York to Orlando. So we have a big presence, Boston, New York City, D.C., um, the, uh, Raleigh, Durham, Orlando, and then we're in Chicago, Denver, Dallas, Austin, and then uh, Bay Area and Southern California and Seattle. So that's our footprint. Um, We're vertically integrated. We're based in Southern California. Uh, We uh, have about 530 employees. Um, Many of them are on the property management side, and uh, we primarily serve uh, families that are between 50 and 80 percent of AMI uh, uh, area median income. So our business is primarily targeted at uh, rent restricted housing, either built with tax credits or project based Section 8. So we serve uh, the need of, of working people who uh, work very hard in pursuing the American dream. And, and um, so that that's our business. And and. Um, there's a big need for what we do today. You've been in the real estate business for uh, several decades now. And when I say your name to people, I often hear things like legend or legendary. <laughs> but long before you uh, became a real estate developer or a real estate investment manager, I should say, uh, you, you, were, you were little, Daryl. Tell us about, um, you know, how did you get in? You know, tell us about how, you know, where you grew up, because I, I think there's an interesting story there. And then kind of your pathway into uh, the real estate industry, if you will. Well, I, uh, st- I grew up in Detroit on the west side of Detroit. I'm everything Detroit, Lions, Tigers, uh, uh, Red Wings, Pistons. And uh, I was very blessed to, um, you know, I was a very good high school athlete and was actually uh, recruited and went and attended the, and played basketball at the University of Michigan. So that's, go uh, so go blue. Brandon is a fellow Michigan Wolverine. And, um, you know, University of Michigan really became kind of a, a very important place in my life um, because the, I mean, it's an incredible school. I'm a huge Michigan, you know, fan. But more importantly, it's, it, it has, there are a lot of real estate people that are from the University of Michigan, and a few of them have been intertwined in my life. And um, so when I left, um, uh, Michigan, I went to graduate school at MIT, and then later uh, I started my career in Chicago at Continental Illinois Bank, and uh, which was the fifth largest bank at the time I started in the early 80s. Uh, and one of the things, and I worked in the real estate um, uh, uh, lending area, and um, I learned, and I, early on, I had a client uh, by the name of Sam Zell, who was also a University of Michigan grad, and his partner, uh, Bob Lurie, and uh, that was one of my first clients that I banked, and um, and then I was very blessed at Continental Bank. I worked with a, a just some most talented people, and that we out of my peer group came a number of real estate CEOs. Uh, David Nethercutt, who later became the CEO of Equity Residential, he was in my training class. Peter Donovan, who uh, ran CBRE's financial services. Uh, Marianne King, who was the, uh, who's now the president of Bercadia. Uh, Albert Perez, who's the CEO of a very large Ann Arbor-based company, McKinley Property. Uh, so those were all my peers. We were all in our early 20s starting out in the business 
And the great thing about all of us is that each of us later, we, we all thought that, my God, these people are so much smarter than me. I always <laughs> thought, like, my God, I'm the loser of this group. And I never, it, it was many years later that I reflected on that I was around some of the brightest people that were in the business because the success that that group obtained, you know, attained was, was quite significant. And, 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 you know, if there's a lesson learned for me and it's been a part of my life are relationships. And, and I look at, you know, the relationship with many of those people I mentioned, they have been very, very instrumental in my career and, um, you know, and, and some of the early, uh, borrowers that I lent money to were people like, uh, Jeff Stack at Saris Regis. I knew, you know, I've known Jeff for, you know, 40 plus years and Jeff's a very close friend. He's also an investor in our company. Uh, and, and then later, so, you know, those relationships were, were really the key to, my career over the years. And when you were at Michigan playing basketball, um, did you know that you wanted to be in real estate? Is it something that you had exposure to growing up or kind of how did that transition happen? Because it seems like you ended up at a lender, but I'm sure there's kind of more to it than that. Well, the the funny thing is I wanted to go into development to use combination of my architectural background and, you know, what I learned about construction and also later in finance. And I, w I first joined Continental Bank in between my business school two years. And I figured it'd be a great place to just get exposure in a bank because money is drives the business. And then I learned that Wow, from the money side, you really see where all the that that's the the critical element in development is money. And I said, you know, maybe I should start my career being close to the money. And I never regretted it. And again, when people, particularly, you know, 40 years ago, when Sam Zell wanted to borrow money, Sam didn't send anyone else. He may have sent someone to a, uh, a a community meeting or something like that. But when it came to borrow money, Sam showed up and was in front of you. So that was kind of my early days of being exposed to a lot of very successful developers and investors and learning directly from them. And you mentioned your background in architecture. You're, you know, very humble and skipping over your your degrees in in architecture. You have a, I believe, you have an undergrad and a and a master's in architecture. Yes. Is that am I saying it? Okay. And what what why why architecture? What what got you interested in studying that? Because those are not, um, you know, we were joking before we started recording. I, you know, it, it, you're a glutton for punishment because architecture at the University of Michigan, and I'm sure MIT is no different. Is one of the most you know academically intensive programs you can choose. Well. I have some artistic ability. I like to, I did like to draw. I love math, but, and I was going to study engineering, but I didn't want that much math. I didn't like <laughs> writing papers. So there were no, not a lot of papers in architecture. So it was kind of a balance. I'm not sure I was just driven to be an architect, but I looked at all the, 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 what I would take in terms of classes and they were things that interest me. So it, I, I don't think I was ever driven. I mean, I worked with some incredibly talented. I went to school with some incredibly talented architects. One of my classmates at MIT um, is Diane Hoskins, who's the chairman CEO of Gensler. And, you know, I, could, I looked at Diane back then and I'm like, wow, she is a talented architect. I knew I wasn't that talented. Um, and, and Diane and I are great friends today. She's current chairwoman of uh, ULI, and I'm on the board of governors. But, uh, but anyway, so I never had that burning desire to be an architect, but I like the study of architecture. So you had these great formative experiences, both with great people and great clients at the bank. Um, what, what came next for you? Well, um, you know, one of the things, when, you know, I was based in Chicago, and I, while I was at the bank, I primarily, um, I, I had some, you know, like, you know, at the time, Sam Zell was doing a lot of mobile home parks and things like that. But I was on the housing side, and most of my home building clients were in three states. They were in California, Florida, and Arizona. And when you're a Midwest kid that lived in Detroit, Boston, and Chicago, 
um, Brandon, I didn't, I wasn't blessed to have grown up in San Diego, but once I start traveling to all these places, I remember, uh, in the, the eighties, uh, going to Rancho Santa Fe, uh, Fairbanks ranch. I, that was one of my loans. And I'm like, my God, this is, this is incredible. <laughs> and so I decided after two or three years of Chicago winners that I was going to put job feelers out and whichever one I got to first, Florida, Arizona, or California, I was going there. I decided I was sick of cold weather. And, and fortunately, I, uh, my first job that I was very interested in was with Westinghouse Financial that was based in Orange County, Newport Beach, California. So that was where I moved and I took a job. And, and, and that was five years after my time in, in Chicago and worked there another five or six years. And then um, it, on the investment side, because we did debt and equity, I uh, worked with some incredible colleagues. In fact, that's where John Williams, who's my partner, John and I met during those days. John, I had just been promoted to run the Orange County office. John was an analyst in, in Pittsburgh. And I went and said, hey, uh, I needed a person. I said, do you want to move to Newport Beach from Pittsburgh? Like, uh, yeah, I'm there. <laughs> and so that's how John and I uh, first met in the late 80s. And we worked together and became uh, great friends. Um, and, and then, you know, I left there in the early nineties and I had this, uh, you know, wanted to start my own business and, and teamed up with uh, a gentleman by the name of Quentin Primo and Quentin, uh, and I went to high school together in Detroit. Um, and Quentin and I had, we were kind of a, a match pair on paper. He was, uh, he went to university of Indiana, which was of course our arch rival and then he, um, uh, when I, we were both in Boston at the same time, he was at Harvard Business School while I was at, at MIT. And then he ended up taking a job in Chicago and we worked right across the street from each other. He went, he took a job at Citicorp and I, and so, you know, we were two young guys in our twenties closing down the bars on Rush Street and, uh, you know, we're great friends and then they eventually decided to start a business together you know, um, 10 years into our careers and we started Capri Capital, uh, which was an investment firm that um, uh, we focused on raising institutional capital to primarily invest in apartments. We also had a debt business that we were a Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac multifamily lender. And um, we built that business to some size and scale and the irony of that business is we ended up selling it in 2005 to uh, two other University of Michigan graduates, uh, Steve Ross and Jeff Blau at Related. So, I've heard of them. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> and, uh, and, and I, could, I actually uh, worked uh, at Related for three years after we sold the business and, and got to know Jeff and, and Stephen uh, two exceptional people. And, and uh, actually, my ringtone that I have on my phone, it's, I originally got from Ross. So, <laughs> Wow. That's great. And so um, so that was Capri. You sold it. Was it too related at the time or was there yes. a different? Uh, okay. Well, it was an affiliate of related that was called Centerline and it was the public vehicle they had created. They had uh, created a public platform for the tax credit business. So that's where we we sold. And um, and then, you know, we had an investment business that Quentin and I, my, you know, we decided very amicably I wanted to do some different things as did Quentin. And so ultimately, um, we split again very amicably. And then I started a Vanith after, you know, my commitments to at a three and a half year commitment to Related. And after that, I started a Vanith in, in uh, 2008. And really, a lot of it was I learned a lot about the affordable business um, from you know my day the the time it related. It was almost like another graduate degree. And while related has this incredible, you think of Hudson Yards and all some of these incredible developments, you know the basis of that company was affordable housing, and that was something that Steve. Uh, Stephen had an incredible passion for, and I learned a lot being there. 
And in particular, I learned a lot because, of course, they were a big tax credit investor. And sometimes I'd go to properties that, of course, they were not owned by related, but other operators. And I was always disappointed as to the quality of the upkeep and the customer service. And so as I contemplated my next move in life, you know, I said, you know, I think there's a better paradigm for preserving affordable housing and potentially creating new affordable housing. So um, I, I started Avanath, which Avanath comes from um, my two kids. My daughter's name is Ava and my son's name is Nathan. And um, so that's, you know, started that company in 2000, 2008 with about five former uh, Capri uh, colleagues that uh, joined me in, in launching the business. And we had this vision, wasn't sure exactly whether we could pull that off, but we were fortunate we raised our first institutional fund that, you know, we started raising in a horrible time after the, the collapse of the you know, the, the, the great financial crash. And we, um, but we, we raised $120 million and, and we started on this uh, path. Um, and, and I remember the, our first six investors and, you know, and we had this vision. And again, I wasn't sure we could do it, but I thought we could. And that is really acquire some older affordable properties that are rent restricted, you know, improve them, improve the cash flow, improve the customer service. So that's what we tried to do. And, and we started gaining traction and, and improving the quality of assets that had many times fallen on, on, on very bad times. The one structural aspect of the, uh, without getting into all kinds of technical issues, with the low-income housing tax credit business, which is probably – the best business to add new affordable supply, but there are a lot of limitations, one of which there's not mechanisms for reinvesting in the properties after they're built. And so generally after 10 to 15 years, they just fall in, you know, they're, they're, they're not in the best, um, you know, ma- they're not well-maintained and, 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 and well-kept. And so that became the universe of what we started to to acquire and build our portfolio. Um, Eventually, we didn't like the way that most third-party managers manage those communities. So we built our own our own management company, and um, and so you know, I it's it's like many times in, in companies, and and it happened in my first company. I can remember the early days of, you know, getting things off the ground. And then all of a sudden, one day you look and like, okay, it's been 17 years later. And, and we now have, we have, where did these 530 people come from? And that's what it feels like because it happens very quickly. We, we grew, um, we took the opportunity during COVID when many people pulled back, we really ramped up and we probably bought $2 billion dollars of properties during COVID. And, you know, and, and while people were concerned, oh my God, what's going to happen? And are there going to be collection issues? We knew that housing affordability was still a significant challenge in this country and whatever, you know, and, and that COVID was a relatively short term issue in the scheme of a 10 or 15 year investment horizon. So, some of the deals we bought during that time frame were are some of the best that we own. That's incredible. And I want to talk more about Avanith and affordable housing and in the kind of housing crisis that we're having in this country right now. But before I do, you you took a big leap. You went from working for other people to working for yourself, I guess, when you started Capri. And then you were at related, but how did you know it was time to go back out on your own? Or is would you know, is this always been in your DNA to kind of go solo? You said something earlier, you know, you weren't sure if it was gonna work, but you believed it might. You know, it's it's um I'm not sure. I you know, first I I wanna say that I'm it's incredibly blessed. I worked in three incredible companies sort of in my corporate days. 
uh, Continental Bank, Westinghouse Financial, and Related. And there were three exceptional companies that I was very well compensated. I was, you know, they were, it, it was an incredible experience. And all those were incredible experiences. I learned a lot. I was around exceptional people. Um, but being around very high quality people and makes you think and, and it pushes you. And sometimes, you know, I, I am probably, uh, uh, there's no question about this. I am far more, as an entrepreneur, I am far more motivated by taking on challenges than necessarily financial rewards. I mean, certainly financial rewards come with entrepreneurship when you're successful. But, you know, if I had stayed in corporate America, I think I would be in financially a similar position. So I've never necessarily done it for the money. I think that you do it for the challenge of it. And, um, you know, we, we, uh, during the Capri days, one of the things that many large pension funds were getting away from, they were, or they were investing in suburban areas, but not urban inner city areas. And so one of the things we did during those days, we made the business case to large institutional investors. Hey, you can make money investing in South Central Los Angeles or West Oakland, or some other areas, particularly communities of color that very often were overlooked from a capital standpoint. And, um, you know, we would show people the demand is there, the need for housing is there, the need for other types of investments. And so, you know, one of the things that ha has always been part of my approach is to look at areas that are not being underserved by that are not being served by capital and try to create an investment strategy around that so you know the, the when you look outside of tax oriented vehicles for affordable housing you know very you know uh, most in large institutions would turn their nose at that you know look at affordable housing and say, God, that's not something I want to invest in. And so part of our strategy in building a Vanith has been to overcome many of the myths. And, you know, people will say, well, you know, like half of our residents are Section 8 voucher holders. When you say that, someone says, oh, my God, I don't want that. That doesn't, uh, you know, those people don't pay rent. They don't take care of properties. And, you know, what I have learned to counter these myths, and this goes to my MIT side of my my life, is that data transcends everything. And so when you hear that objection from an investor, well, my God, the collections, you know, we don't want that because there are collection problems. And you say, our default rate on our Section 8 portfolio is less than 10 basis points. Hmm. And you drop the mic. Because that you can't, you can, you might have your biases of how you might think it looks, but data is something that, and, and obviously, you know, it, it's a key part of the relationship with your company is that we continue, we believe that um, our investment strategy uh, is supported by the analytics behind you know, what we do and capturing the data and doing it efficiently and, and all the other things that, that as we build our case for our investment strategy, it's great to have data and to have that efficiently um, managed and to be able to present it in a way that you can counteract myths. Because there's, a you know, people, um, you know, I've often told a story of going to one of our properties and there was a chief investment officer of a very large pension fund who called me the night before. And, and ironically, they were looking at a property in Loudoun County, Virginia, which is probably, think of it as Orange County. It is the most affluent county in Virginia with median incomes of about 120000 a year. And this person called me the night before. He said, Daryl, I just have to double check. When I show up tomorrow, is there any possibility I'm going to get shot? And my response was, well, I don't know your personal situation, who you owe money to. Do you have a jealous mistress? 
I said, you know, notwithstanding any of your personal situations, when you come to our property tomorrow at 10 o'clock in Loudoun County, it's going to be empty because everybody works and the chances of getting shot are remote. But those are the kinds of things that you often deal with, particularly in some of the markets we invest in and serving a, a resident base that is the, at the income level. And, and you know, people uh, assume that affordable housing, I mean, one of the things we have gotten into this industry of creating is affordable housing, there's workforce housing and all the other things, which I always find slightly offensive in terms of, our, you know, 95% of our residents work and they, you know, and if they, and, and, you know, including our Section 8 voucher holders and people say, well, they work. And very often we have two incomes and they say, well, why do they get Section 8 vouchers? Because the rent is $2,000 a month. They both work at Walmart. They can afford to pay $1,000. But that is a family that is pursuing their American dream. And there is, you know, so the, the perception of what the residents that live there, they're hardworking Americans who are pursuing the American dream, although the perception is something else. And it's gang members and it's, you know, welfare mothers and all these, you know, negative images. And, and you know, w one of the things as we go and, and talk to people about new supply of affordable housing and existing homeowners and people that push back, you know, the one thing I often tell them when they, they say, well, we don't want any affordable housing here. And I said, well, where are your kids that have $100,000 of loans and they work at Starbucks? Where are they going to live if they don't live in our apartments? And, you know, very often that's always my messaging with, you know, with community groups is, is just saying that, hey, you know, you're, where are your kids going to live in these high cost markets? The CIO story is, uh, is incredible. And I think it, it does highlight the knowledge gap that, that might exist um, between, you know, some of the different, you know, universes in, in our industry. When you started Avanath in 2008, correct me if I'm wrong, but that was very early days for the quote, you know, institutionalization of, you know, of, of the housing industry broadly, but specifically affordable housing, um, a subset of it. Uh, what, you know, how, how has it changed over the last, you know, 15, 20 years since you started Avanath in terms of institutional capital's appetite for affordable? Who's, who's really kind of gotten this and, you know, believes that the myths are truly that and who are still kind of susceptible to some of these myths and haven't yet seen the light? You know, Brandon, probably the most important thing is that, of course, the first thing is we generated very attractive returns for our investors, and people see that and other people follow. Um, you know, of course, probably one of the biggest entities in the country, Blackstone, made a big investment in affordable housing, I think, three or four years ago when they bought AIG's portfolio. Starwood also made a big investment in the space. And people, of course, call me, oh, my God, what do you think about that, that Blackstone? The, the amazing thing, after Blackstone made that investment, we probably got more investors that approached us unsolicited than we ever got. And why? Hmm. Because Blackstone is now investing in it. This must really be good. And others say, well, who else is in this business? And people would find us. So, you know. The, the, the reality of it is that those kinds of entrance into the market has only helped us because it's given a credibility, a legitimacy to it that um, says, hey, it's okay to put institutional capital in this. So we still have a long way to go. Um, there is still, um, I mean, one of the things that is fascinating when you look at the affordable housing rent regulated market, which is about 6 million uh, apartment units. And then if you add the uh, kind of B, pro the C properties that serve a similar income, it's probably another six or 7 million units. So there's 13 million units in that space. Um, 
the top 50 owners own less than 10% of that universe. Hmm. So it is highly fragmented. So even with a Blackstone and Starwood and, you know, our, you know, our funds, uh, our first one started out to be a, a, a 120 million, then it went to 250 million. Then our third one went to 400 million. Our, our, our third one went to 400 million. Our fourth one went to almost 800 million. And then our, we now have an open-ended vehicle that's at a billion four, which is pretty good growth. But it's, it, it, we are still, when you look even with that amount of capital deployment and all the other big capital, we just are, it's a tip of the iceberg of what the need is in affordable housing preservation, as well as the need for more affordable units. Because there's a huge amount of people that pay more than 40% of their income for housing. So, you know, the, 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 what I would say is that the, the landscape is, has become more positive. Um, one of the things that was a game changer for us, because it was so, you know, the situation I mentioned with the CIO, we started looking outside the U.S. and, and we started looking specifically in Europe and primarily four countries, the Netherlands, Germany, uh, the UK, and Switzerland. And what we learned as we started talking to investors there, they were big investors in affordable housing in their country. If you describe the Section 8 program to a German investor, they'll say, oh, that's good. We have something like that. Generally, in speaking in those countries, if you make under about 70000 a year, you get some level of a housing subsidy. And they don't view that as a negative. They said, oh, that's a good thing. And so um, our fourth fund, we probably had, uh, you know, 50, uh, probably about 60% of our investors came outside the U.S., and now, as I look at our portfolio of four billion dollars, about half of our capital comes from outside the U.S. And again, the other countries have approached housing affordability much different than the U.S. And there's a lot that we can learn, you know, from countries like Germany and even Singapore and the way they do it. So, you know, the capital flows I think have been very positive, although we need there's still a significant need for capital in this sector. Interesting. Yeah, I think the societal differences are fascinating. I lived in Hong Kong, as many of our listeners know, for seven years and spent quite a bit of time in Singapore and the, you know, the the government owned housing you just mentioned. You know, now now that I'm thinking about it, I never really made the connection. But of course it's affordable housing. It's government subsidized for low income workers and it's a widely promoted to society as as a as a societal benefit that that's offered to the citizens of Singapore. So fascinating to to make that connection. Yeah. When you when you think about you know the the housing crisis that we have, I know you spend a lot of time, you know, in a variety of capacities, which you could share more with me about. I believe you know NMHC and others on Capitol Hill and lobbying. Kind of what are you hearing from you know the lawmakers about you know the affordability and the housing crisis that we're having right now? And you know, as you look into your crystal ball and look forward, I mean, what do you hope you will see happen uh, going forward? Well. I would start off by saying that housing affordability is at a crisis level in the U.S., and I think it's recognized on you know, both parties, and it's at the federal level, it's at the state level, and it's at the local level. And, and, and each have different issues to deal with. Certainly at the local level, it's cities, there's homelessness. That certainly has a correlation to housing affordability. And what we see is that at all levels, whether it's HUD, whether it's the uh, Housing Authority of the City of LA, which is a great partner. I mean, we have relationships with about um, over 60 different housing authority and state housing finance agencies across the country. They routinely are asking us to help them come up with solutions for housing affordability. Can we do? So one of the things we've been doing are, are figuring out structures with our capital that maybe we'll put buy something that doesn't have affordability restrictions 
and put affordability restrictions on in exchange for tax abatements or a pilot, which is um, payment in lieu of, of, of taxes, which is a, 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 a mortgage structure. So we are finding that there is innovation at all levels of um, government, including HUD. And HUD is a very maligned agency. Um, but, you know, we, we, we partner with HUD and we have great relationships with the various HUD offices around the country who are always, their doors are open and they're always encouraging us. You know, we bought a very large property in LA in 2022. If you ever saw the movie um, Training Day, it was the movie that where Denzel Washington ended up in the end of the movie. And it looks quite menacing, but it's a it's a community called Baldwin Village, and we bought almost 700 apartments there in 2022. And when we approached it, and this was not no rent regulations or anything, we approached the housing authority of the city of L.A. And we said, hey, um, could you potentially, and they are a statutory agency that can grant a tax abatement. And we said, would that be something you consider if we bought it? And they said, absolutely. And they were tr- they were. There's lots of concern in that community about people buying property and doubling the rents. So ultimately, we we bought it. The housing authority of the city of L.A. approved the transaction and able to close within 120 days. They were extraordinary. They, you know, and 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 so that where we we bought a property that we have now 70% of that property is rent restricted at the 60 and uh 80% levels and the tax abatement is the equivalent of about a 35 or 40% rent increase so it's a win win and we're putting in about 40 50 million dollars of renovations so these are the kinds of things when we did that transaction we had Others, you know, mayors calling me, hey, can you come here to this city and do this or that city? And so what I'd like to say is, you know, it's in my 42 years of being in the real estate business, the need for affordable housing uh, over the next five years, I don't think there's ever been a product need in our country in my lifetime that is as great as the need for affordable housing. And so, you know, I think that, of course, on the political side, which we don't really get into, is just the the, the approaches. But the the great thing that the, the the need is such that everybody is willing to listen to good ideas, and you know, the perception is that um, you know that the all the ideas come from the private sector. It really isn't. I mean, you know, we. We look at some of, you know, like a place we do business, which is the state of Florida, the, the, the Florida Housing Finance Agency are some of the brightest people. And we, you know, we will come up with ideas. They will present ideas to us. And that's the spirit in which I think government today and the public sector is embracing companies like ours and saying, hey, let's come up with solutions to, to you know, um, to, to both preserve more and create more housing affordability, but also to add more in terms of new supply. You've been a trailblazer in affordable housing for a long time now. The Baldwin Village story to me strikes me as so obvious listening to how you describe it. Something tells me it wasn't as obvious uh, at the time to others. Otherwise, somebody probably would have done it before you. I mean, I guess the, the question is like, is this the unique advantage of Advanit that you have the ability to work with these agencies on creative solutions? And and I, I suppose it's a leading question because if it isn't, why is everybody else not thinking more like you to create an increase in uh, affordable housing stock? Well, I think a couple of things, and, and I'm going to say something that, you know, one of the things that as we got into this business that I thought it was important is to sit down with the people in the public sector and listen to them. Um, one of my early mentors and uh, in this business was the head of compliance for the state of California for affordable housing. Uh, her name was Rose Guerrero. She's now retired. 
And when I went to visit Rose for the first time, she had turned down something we had requested. And I requested a meeting with her. And she told me this story about her growing up in public housing. And, and I listened to her and she told me why she, something I'd asked she had said. And it was the first time we met. We, I think we owned two properties in California then. And I listened to her and then I kind of told her my story of growing up in Detroit and everything. And then she just made it. She said, you know, Daryl, we can do a lot of work together if you listen to me and understand what we are trying to accomplish. And we'll listen to you and figure that out. And I think that that became sort of my guiding light in uh, as we go to a new market or a new city, we sit down with the people who are, you know, at the forefront of affordable housing, which are generally the, the public housing authorities, and we listen to them and say, what are your, what are you being challenged by? And, and, you know, we have, you know, in an unnamed city, we bought a property that had a very bad actor and, and, you know, and what happens you know, whether it's a HUD office or a public housing agency, the residents will call their congressman, the congressman will call the secretary of HUD, they will call that local office or housing authority. And it's, you know, and so to the extent we can make residents happy that live in rent regulated housing, it, it eases, it makes the lives better of the people in the housing authorities. And so we've tried to partner with them and and that's been part of our secret sauce. And and maybe you ask, why don't others do it? I, I'm not sure that, you know, what I hear from many of them is that someone will send their most junior person there and they're arrogant and they view them as an impediment worse versus me. I'll show up along with my leaders and we'll say, hey, how can we partner? How can we help you? What can what can we help? solve. And I think it's the approach. And we get a very, very supportive audience. And I think it's it's no more than the humility that we approach these uh, these individuals. And, and what we have learned, many have great ideas that help us in our business. So we don't, it's not just the two, uh, one way. They really pr provide us the, the, the many of the tools that we you know, certain things we don't know. And they said, well, if, you know, here's how the regulatory thing. So they, you know, so it's been a partnership with us and our 60 plus um, housing authority and state agency partners. When, when you're looking at a affordable community, you mentioned, you know, you want to make these wonderful places to live. You want to make these parts of the community. What are some of the kind of attributes or characteristics do you think about that are requirements for communities that you own or that are kind of hallmarks of communities that you own? I think the first thing is that people want to be, when there's a problem in their apartment, please be responsive. 90% of the, and, and that's whether you're in a $5,000 a month apartment or you're in a $1,000 a month apartment. I mean, people care. This is someone's home. And what I tell our team all the time is, look, if we take care of our residents and we're responsive to their needs, everything else will work. We will make enough money. We will, you know, we will, all the other things drive from great customer service. So I think it always starts there. And I think that's, that's you know, if you do a Venn diagram, that's the apartment industry is being responsive. The second thing is, I think, recognizing that the um that you know there are some differences i mean what one of the things we've learned you know we've had very high adoption of technology in some affordable communities and one of the reasons is that when parents are working who do they send to the rental office but the kids kids speak in sometimes better english and in a uh, diverse community where english is not the dominant language and and you will show the that all the kids have smartphones. You may show them an app of how to do something, and they don't come back in. They got it, and the, you know. So I mean, there are a lot of things that we've learned about, you know, the, our our resident base that um you know that 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 helps them serve them. And I think 
you know, one of the other aspects of what, in terms of a specific physical aspect of what we look at, we love properties or we love to create bigger apartments because the strongest demand these days are families with multi-generational families. And since 2000, only 8% of the, the apartments built in America are bigger than two apart than uh, two bedroom. That's hmm. been the growth of the single family rental business is that there is a demand for larger bedroom count apartments. So we even on renovations, if we can get more higher bedroom account, we we don't like we prefer not to have studios. We try to you know get as many twos, threes, and even in some communities we have four bedrooms. So that may be and 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 that really solves that issue. I mean, in many respects, my family, which was an immigrant family in a way that my parents moved from Mississippi to Detroit. Um, and when I was t- in both parents worked and then my grandparents moved in with us. So that was the child care for, for my siblings and I were our grandparents during the day. And then that later translated to elder care for them. And that's, you know, we, we have, of course, today we have a, a lot of us aging baby boomers and then, you know, um, and where there are going to be solutions for the, the care long term. So anyway, that so, you know, the, the what I like to say about the affordable housing business is 90 percent of the blocking and tackling is like the conventional business. But there are indeed differences. When you think about the difference between apartments and you mentioned single family rental housing, you know, I've had David Howard on who you may know from either your ULI days or, you know, his current days at the Rental Housing Council. You know, he he talks about this gap between, you know, the the living space, if you will. I'm sure there's a better way to put it. But yeah, the, you know, the bigger families, you need extended living space. Do you when you think about the footprint of an apartment going forward, do you think three bedroom, four bedroom apartments are going to become more of the norm? Or do you think that it's always going to be apartments cap out at some level and then the step up is single family rental housing, but they'll be more affordable single family rental housing? How's that dynamic playing out? Well, I think there's a general trend of having more bedroom count, which again is why the institutionalization of the single family rental business. And, you know, people, you know, as we get older, the, 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 um, you know, stairs, things like that impact. And and we're finding even in our, you know, we own some age restricted over 55 communities where the median age is probably 70. And, but even in our, our properties that are families, we find that mobility issues are, are increasing. For instance, we are really getting away from carpeting because people with mobility challenges, you know, Hard surfaces are better. Uh, and also the technology today, you can have hard surfaces on a second floor and there's there's abilities to mitigate some of the noise transmission. But I mean, th- we are finding things like that where mobility issues have a greater impact. And so, you know, the, the need for more bedroom count, I think, again, it's, it's, it's also, it's on both ends. It kind of incubates some of the, um, you know, my kids are 21 and, and, and 20, and I guess they're going to be incubated, you know, after college for a few years at home. And then, you know, at some point, you know, there's, there's care for, for me or whatever. But, you know, that's just, I, I see that direction because we don't have enough assistant living and things like that. And more people will age in place, but will be age place age in place in a more family type environment. That's one of the trends I see. Well, I want to switch gears for the remaining time that we have and talk a little bit about, you know, your leadership and and kind of some of the changes that you've helped to effectuate in the industry. You know, I I don't know um, kind of how you think about your role as a leader and a mentor, but one of the things that you're very well known for is as a, you know, proponent and advocate of diversity in the real estate industry and would be curious to kind of get your take on, you know, how good or bad of a job do you think we as the, you know, alternatives industry or real estate industry are doing and bringing, 
you know, a more diverse workforce uh, together to, to ensure that we have the ideas? And, you know, what do you think we can all be doing differently uh, to help accelerate, you know, this change that we want to see uh, for, for our industry? Well, I, I would start off by saying, I think, you know, I, I, I give the industry, specifically the apartment industry, um, I, I give them, I think we are trying. I think a lot of people are trying. I remember the early days, and I think, I, I, I know I was an officer of NMHC, and the chairman was Rick Campo, and we start talking about that. And Rick, uh, who is one of the exceptional people in this business, and Rick, after we talked about it as a meeting, um, that we need to do more about it, the first thing um, Rick did, and then we had a, a call a couple of weeks later, he said, guys, I figured out I'm the problem. He said, on my board, I had, I had 10 white guys. And he said, that's a bad look. He said, I asked two to re re resign and I, I selected a, you know, two diverse board members. And he did it immediately. And he said, you know, that's the right thing to do looking at our resident base. And so you had people like that, Tom Bazzuto, uh, a number of people, Doug Bibby, when he, you know, as leading NMHC, that we've had this diversity initiative in the apartment industry. And I think we've all embraced it. I mean, and again, I look at someone like Rick Campo and Rick is, is really my, one of my heroes in the business and also a very, very good friend. Um, I think we are taking it on. We certainly could be doing better. Um, you know, one, you know, one, you know, we, we've tried some things. I mean, one, if you look at the apartment business, if you look, for instance, at the investment side of the business, it kind of looks one way. You look at the property management business, there's a lot of diversity and there's, you know, lots of folks of color. And a few years ago, we had a very talented, um, young African-American uh, property manager who up in Sacramento, and she took on a very tough property that we got. It was at 100 percent. And when I went to the, and I had heard of her and her name is Tierra and if she hears this, she'll be embarrassed. But, you know, I, I, when I went up there, I'm like, wow. And, and when I saw, you know, I was going to meet this woman who I had visioned someone in their forties or fifties. And I see what looks like a teenager in one of our shirts. And I'm like, I'm looking for Tierra. And she said, I'm Tierra. And I'm like, you don't look old enough to be doing this. <laughs> <laughs> and I know that's not the appropriate thing to say, but I'm like, are, are you old enough? And she looked at me and she said, Mr. Carter, yes, I'm old enough. I'm at 100% occupancy and I'm at max rent. So I think I'm old enough. And I'm like, okay, touche. And, you know, and, and just a delight, great education. And then one day I said, you know, how would you like to look at the investment side? Because very few people on that side ever go, and let's face it, in the, you know, we're an investment business. The wealth creation side is more that side of the business. And so, um, Tierra was one of the people we, we decided we wanted to give an opportunity to move over in our investment area. And since then, and she was one of the first, and she is a star. And we've moved other people over and what it's meant to the people on our property management side, not that they're second class citizens, but their career paths beyond and some a lot of people like the property management side, but they know that there are other uh, areas. But the best thing about, you know, Tierra coming to the investment side that and when people are running numbers on pro formas and and um you know, and, and well, I'm going to have this many people, maintenance people. And from someone who was hands-on operating a property, she'll, she'll call BS and said, hey, look, you need this and this is why. But it's made our investment team better because we have people who have different perspectives, which is probably the most important part of diversity is not that people – I mean, it is nice to have people that are, are different, but the different perspectives of people seeing things differently helps you make better decisions. And I think that clearly as we've brought people from that side of our business to our investment side business, we do it much better.
And so I, I think that we, the industry has done, I think we've made progress. I think we have more progress to do. And I really think that when, um, you know, part of it is that, Many of our communities are highly diverse, and, and I think it enables us to understand what goes on in certain neighborhoods and communities better when you have people that may have originated in communities like that. I think that makes a lot of sense, and that's a great you know, lesson for other leaders who might be listening to this podcast to take away is you know, not only is it the right thing to do, but oftentimes, in fact, most of the time, it's the best thing to do from a business perspective. Absolutely. You've had the opportunity, you've mentioned, you know, many, many names of individuals who I've had the great pleasure of crossing paths with, but not getting to know in the same way that you've interacted with them throughout your career. You know, Sam Zell, Lori, um, you know, the uh, Rip Campo, uh, you know, uh, you, know you, you name it, you, you've mentioned off, you rattled off, you know, many dozens of, of industry leaders and icons. And I'm curious, you know, together with your own leadership style, you know, what do you think are markers of great leadership? And, you know, is there anything that you've learned from being around other leaders who are kind of embody those, those markers that, that you can share with, with our listeners? I would say the first thing, which is counterintuitive is patience. Because most ambitious people, that's the last thing they want is the, you know, patience. And, and, you know, you, as a leader, you have to be patient. Um, it doesn't mean that you, for instance, tolerate mediocrity, but you you have to have a temperament and patience that creates a calmness within the organization that, you know, uh, I've tried. And, and sometimes I'm not. I lose it on occasion, not often, not as much as I did 30 years ago. But, you know, when someone will walk in my office, I always they say, we have a problem. The first thing I said, did anyone die? They say, no. Okay. Well, at least you know, we've got that side. But you start getting, you know, trying to have perspective on things. And, and you know, we don't always get it right. We, you know, we're in a very imperfect business. It's hard to get with all the things we do in apartment companies, you know, and, and, Everybody, you know, from uh, Ken Valick to David Schwartz, all my friends who, you know, we we will sometimes laugh at things we get wrong because we do get them wrong. Um, but just having the um, understanding that it happens, it's a very people intensive business. Sometimes people make mistakes. Um, what we try to do is minimize things that deal with life, health, safety. You know, you don't want to miss there. And we have protocols that kind of do that. But I think, you know, leadership is, 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 is patience. It's also, um, you know, I think that, you know, I spend a lot of time, you know, looking at, you know, recognizing the differences in people that, you know, um, th that I know. Um, my CFO, who Wes Wilson, Wes thinks very different from John. And when I, li you know, and 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 it's I I I've learned to you know listen and to to you know I listen to everybody, but just trying to calibrate the fact that everybody is different, and you want that. You don't want people to be clones. You don't want. Um, so and and the other thing that we had an investor that told me something. A couple of years ago, when we're in a due diligence meeting, this was a very large German investor, and we were in a due diligence meeting, and one of the, our younger team members, I said something, and he raised his hand. He said, Daryl, I'm sorry to, to interrupt, but that's not the case. It's this. And I remember saying, thanks. His name was Connor. I said, thanks, Connor. I appreciate that. You're right. It's this. And so in the day of doing due diligence and, and John would say something, someone else would say, well, it's also, John, let me add this. And at the end of the day, the, the, the guy, and it was, again, a large German investor said, you know what I like about your company? That anybody felt at any time that they could raise their hand 
and that most people don't do that, particularly to correct a senior person in a public thing. But we encourage that like, hey, do not, you know, if you see the car going off the road, raise your hand. And so that's, to me, important in culture to have the safety to, you know, uh, to, to be able to do that. I mean, I remember last year, another, ironically, another German investor, I had a group of our interns in our due diligence meeting. And after the meeting, and one of the interns was my son, who is now 21. And um, after the meeting, they came in my office and said, um, Dad, that's the first time they'd ever been at a due diligence meeting with an investor. We said, you know, we kind of give you on a scale of one to 10, that was kind of a five. We don't think you were very good. Oh, wow. <laughs> and I'm like, what? And I'm like, okay, by what standard given that they, and they, they first said, well, it was a two hour meeting and you never gave your guests a break. So, of course, they were the ones that wanted a break. And then they, they had a list of things. And, and it was really, I was amused. And one of the things they said, well, you talk too much. Now, these investors had met John and Wes. They had not met me. And they wanted to hear from me. But I didn't tell them that. So the, the funny thing afterwards, we were meeting, I think that was a Monday. I was meeting the same group in New York to do, walk some of our properties. And the, the intern said, well, perhaps we should go along to make sure that you don't screw up again. <laughs> but when I then told, I, and I felt comfortable, I said, well, how did you guys think Monday went? The, the, the investors, they said, oh, we, it was perfect. It's, I said, well, the, the, the group of interns, and I had asked them, I said, do you mind if our summer interns sit in? They said, oh, that's great. I said, they didn't think I did very well. <laughs> and they were totally amused. And he said, you know, the fact that you listened to your interns was a pretty good thing, that we like that, that kind of a culture. So anyway, uh, we, we were able to convert that investor as well. But, but uh I think listening is, is, is a very important thing. And, and it's something that I've learned from, you know, there, there, are, there are some great iconic CEOs in this business. You know, I, I was with Tom Toomey last week, who's also a great friend. And, you know, and, and, and just, you know, and, and whenever I have that opportunity to spend time with someone like Tom or, or Rick Campbell, I always pick their brain to just find out, these things because sometimes, you know, you, I mean, uh, I learn a lot from my friends. And so, you know, and, that, and it's probably of all the things about being in this apart, the apartment industry, while there's many of us that compete, we compete for capital, we compete for, you know, um, I look at, you know, the David Swart, Lily Dunn, who's another Michigan person, Jeff Blau, and all these people, they're friends and they're, they're beyond, competitors. I mean, if, if, if Ken Valak or people like that, they call and they say, Hey, Daryl, can I, you're using this, does that work? And you know, I'm open book. And it's something that I, that I love about the industry is that I have peers that, you know, that I can call and just commiserate with. And it, it's a real blessing to me. And I've certainly, this is an industry that has blessed me and, and certainly many of the friendships are much richer than anything financially that I earn out of the business. Well, I love that. And there's so much there, but unfortunately we are out of time for today. Absolutely. I have really enjoyed our conversation, Daryl. Thank you so much for sharing some of your story with us. Well, Brandon, thank you very much. And again, we appreciate everything that uh, your company does for us. And this was a lot of fun to, to have be interviewed by another Michigan Wolverine. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you.